um, examples of where we've successfully applied pathway network analysis to real data and real projects. Uh, so you can sort of get a sense for some of the, the things that you can do with the uh, topics that we're going to discuss today. So as uh, I hope everybody um, saw in the intro recording video that we made available, um, the beginning of all these types of analyses starts with um, uh, some genomics data, usually uh, a screen or a gene expression analysis study. And you know, the, the first thing that is interesting is that you know, the, the screener, the uh, data worked and, and produced a lot of results. But then the question comes up is, now what? How do I interpret this data? And with genomics data, there's so much being produced. It's a challenge to interpret. And this, you know, the, the trend is that it just continue, the, the data continues to get larger and larger. So single cell transcriptomics experiments, a single experiment that provides information like 5,000, you know, RNA-seq experiments in one experiment. So um, what, what we want to know is, what's interesting, what's novel, um, what new discoveries did I make, what did I learn from this data? Um, and one of the first things that we normally start with is to ask the question, what's interesting about the set of genes or other um, uh, entities, metabolites, proteins, other things that come out of large-scale omics analysis? And, um, you know, usually uh, after you rank the data or cluster it somehow and you get this gene list, uh, one of the ways that the, the main ways that we can um, ask and try to answer this question is to find out if they're enriched in known pathways, complexes, or functions. So can we learn anything about cellular mechanism based on known information um, uh, by just automatically cross-referencing it? And this is more, uh, you know, and using automated methods is more, um, it basically saves time compared to a traditional approach where you'd have to go through the genes one by one and do a literature search on each one. You still have to do some of this usually, but um, the tools that we're learning in this class uh, help you do this much faster. So pathway and network analysis is, in my view, is any type of analysis that helps you gain mechanistic insight into omics data. It might be identifying a master regulator, drug targets, characterizing pathways that are active in a sample, um, uh, in, inferring a, a, a network um, uh, of uh, a, a regulatory network, more broad regulatory network, and uh, looking at phosphorylation sites, any type of mechanistic insight. And it's also any type of analysis that involves pathway or network information, and we'll talk more about that, that later. As I mentioned, it's the most common thing to do once you have a large set of genes that results from an omics data set, and the most popular type is pathway enrichment analysis, but many others are useful, and we'll talk about those as well. So just to go into some examples, um, the first example I've selected is a, a project that we worked on more, uh, more than 10 years ago now on autism spectrum disorder. So autism is a genetic disease that's known to be highly heritable from twin studies, and at the time that the study was uh, started, there were, um, you know, a small amount of the, the heritability could be explained uh, basic from in individual gene mutations that were linked to single, uh, to rare single gene disorders. And it had also been known that um, de novo copy number variants were sort of reported in a number of cases, and so there was some thinking that de novo copy number variants were important in this disease. In this disease. So Stephen Scherer, who is at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, who studies autism genomics and genetics, um, initiated a study to uh, map rare copy number variants in autism spectrum disorder cases, about 1,000 cases and 1,000 controls, roughly, and um, process the data to sort of generate the highest quality set of rare copy number variants. Um, so these were var variants that were less than 1% frequency, and um, the reason that the team focused on rare copy number variants is because the common, it's, it's unlikely that common variants would have explained this more rare disorder. Um, so, and they had previous evidence that rare copy number variants were the sort of one of the important causes. So, um, you know, they found a lot of copy number variants. Uh, they found in general that autism spectrum disorder cases carried more copy number variants and especially de novo copy number variants. Um, which were not inherited from the parents. Um, and 
Um, but there weren't that many genes linked to the copy number variants that were repeatedly seen. Um, uh, there weren't that many repeated copy number variants. It looked like there were different copy number variants in, in, in many of the different uh, individuals. So we did a pathway enrichment analysis um, or pathway analysis on this data. So we took all the genes that were associated with um, all the copy number variants and we mapped them to pathways. So even copy number variants, uh, so they're all rare, but some of them are more rare than others. So some of them are present just in an individual sample and not seen in more than one sample. So we, we took all of that data, all the genes associated with the copy number variants, mapped them to pathways, and then asked the question, which, you know, given a pathway that is defined as a set of genes, um, is the pathway expected to be, uh, is it um, associated with the cases more than we, we'd expect compared to the controls? And the way we figured that out was we, um, we looked at the number of cases that were affected in a gene that was part of a pathway. So let's say we have the, um, uh, you know, a kinase regulation pathway and it has 100 genes in it. Um, we asked, are there any, how many cases are a, a copy number, uh, have, have a copy number variant affecting any of the um, genes in this pathway, any of the 100 genes, and how many controls? So we get a number for each one, say, let's say 10 cases are affected and two controls are affected. And then we shuffle the case control labels thousands of times um, and asked the question again, kept on asking the question to sort of understand what uh, level of difference cases and controls we expect to have by chance. And, and then we computed a, a false discovery rate and a p-value. Um, and that's what um, this color represents. So each circle here represents a pathway. Um, the lines between them represent uh, so each circle represents a pathway that's enriched in the autism cases compared to controls. The color re represents the false discovery rate that I mentioned with uh, lower levels being more significant, uh, lower false discovery rates being more significant and being colored more red. And then um, green lines connect pathways that are shared genes. You can think about this as pathway crosstalk or just redundancy in the, in the pathway databases. And um, so all these circles here represent all the pathways that were um, more enriched in autism cases compared to controls. And as you can see, there were a lot of interesting pathways that, that came up um, and many more, a lot more information than we had from just looking at the individual genes themselves at the gene level. Um, and a number of these pathways were not previously known to be connected to autism. And so one of the things we did was we connected, we collected uh, all the, all the autism genes that we knew about and all the intellectual disability genes that we knew about. And we did a pathway enrichment analysis on those as well, and that's what these triangles here represent and um, uh, um, this parallelogram here. Um, so this, um, you know, so all these pathways are, are known to be enriched in uh, autism and um, all these triangles are known to be enriched in intellectual disability. And then we use these connection lines to sort of say how many genes are common between these pathways. And what we found was that there were quite a few pathways that even though um, they didn't necessarily have, uh, they didn't necessarily, they weren't necessarily mutated in our case control study um, in the known intellectual disability gene, uh, they, um, they were part of pathways that included genes that were, um, you know, related to pathways that were involved in intellectual dis disability and autism. Um, or they have genes in, in common. Um, so, um, you know, so this, this gave us a whole bunch of insight uh, about the mechanism of um, autism spectrum disorder that we didn't know about before and was not possible to identify with just looking at individual genes. And, and maybe just to emphasize, one of the interesting things is when we went about this project is when we went to look at an individual pathway to find out which genes were kind of um, linked to that pathway, we found that, uh, and, and how many samples they were affected in, many of the genes linked to an individual pathway were affected, only were seen in one individual. So we had, um, you know, a lot of genes from the pathway kind of spread out across individuals. So if you took, let's say, 10 genes from a pathway, um, they uh, might be um, mutated in 10 different individuals. And so by looking at the genes, you wouldn't be able to sort of see any repeated pattern, but by looking at the pathways, you could see a repeated pattern. 
and I'll talk about this more in a bit. Okay, so the second project is um, ependymoma pathway analysis. So ependymoma is a brain cancer. Um, it's a, a pediatric brain cancer. It's the third most common type of um, brain cancer in children. Um, and the most common and morbid location for this in childhood is the uh, posterior fossa. Um, and the posterior fossa is at the back of the head, and the brain stem and the cerebellum. Um, and uh, previously people had known, based on the anatomy of where the tumor occurs, of how serious it is. And you know, it, it could occur in many different parts of the brain, but if it occurred at the back of the brain, then people knew it was, it was the most dangerous type. So looking at this type, uh, specifically the posterior fossa and anatomical location, um, Michael Taylor, who's a neurosurgeon at Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto, again, um, who led this project, uh, had previously identified two subtypes of this, um, this disease based on gene expression data clustering. And the A subtype, or posterior fossa A, affects the youngest individuals and has a terrible outcome, and posterior fossa B has, affects the oldest individuals um, and has an excellent outcome. So even though anatomically, people kind of lump, you know, lumped everything together, uh, lumped all cases together if they affected the back of the, the brain and just lumped it all together and said, this is a, a serious, um, this is going to be a serious cancer. Michael found that um, some of those, there's a subtype of those that actually have an excellent outcome and maybe shouldn't be treated as, uh, um, uh, as strongly as the ones that have a terrible outcome. And this is important because there is no there was no treatment, uh, no targeted treatment for ependymoma except for radiation and surgery. And radiation and surgery uh, targeted to the brain is devastating for children. Um, anybody who undergoes this treatment and survives will have not a, will not have a good quality of life uh, for the rest of their life. Um, so the goal of the field is really to try to avoid uh, radiation and surgery treatment um, as much as possible. Um, and come up with more targeted drugs. Um, so even just identifying a subtype that has an excellent outcome might help with this. But Michael wanted to learn more about these, this disease and, and through uh, whole genome sampling and exo, uh, whole genome sequencing and exome sequencing was looking for mutations that might identify a cause for this disease. And unfortunately, we discovered no mutations. Um, there's maybe two or three that were repeated between any of the samples. And this is very unusual for cancer because cancer is thought to be a disease of genome instability filled with mutations. But it's not totally surprising given uh, this is a pediatric cancer. Um, it's true that cancer is a disease of uh, many mutations, but that's, most cancers are adult cancers. And we know that mutations uh, build up over time in our bodies. And um, when you're younger, you have fewer mutations in general. They're correlated with the mutation rate in your in any cell in your body is correlated with age. So, um, you know, and other pediatric tumors have also been shown to have very few mutations. It, unfortunately, it still didn't give us any insight into, any more insight into this disease. Um, but Michael looked at methylation data and found that uh, DNA methylation was able to cluster the data into these two subtypes perfectly. And so that identifies another mechanistic, potential mechanistic insight, which is maybe that DNA methylation or epigenomic processes might be important as the kind of cause of this disease. And in particular, the, the A type, posterior fossa A, uh, was found to be more transcriptionally silenced by CPG island DNA methylation. And this affected about 2,000 genes. And standard pathway enrichment analysis didn't, on these 2,000 genes, didn't pull up any, uh, identify any pathways. Um, we use a, a, a larger pathway database that we discuss in this course and a more um, uh, appropriate statistical test that was more sensitive for this type of data, which I'll, I'll mention in a bit, um, that um, was able to identify a very strong signal of enrichment with um, a particular set, set of mechanisms regarding the, that uh, were connected to the polycomb repressive 2 complex or the poly, uh, PRC2 complex. Um, so this bar plot shows the significance of enrichment. Um, so these numbers are a log uh, scale of the p-value that trans 
forms the p-value into a number that, you know, where the, the bigger the number, the more significant the p-value is. And um, basically, all of these pathways here were significant in uh, the group A tumors, and there was nothing really significant in the group B tumors. And all of these pathways are really related. Um, so SUS12 and EED are, tar uh, um, are subunits of this PRC2 complex, but this is basically means it's all the same thing. And it's just saying that um, when this, uh, wherever this PRC2 complex is, no is uh, known to um, bind or target on the genome, that was, those are the places where it was very enriched. So there was a big overlap in between those known targets and the 2,000 genes we um, saw differentially methylated. And um, PRC2 complex is known to methylate uh, uh, histones, and then DNA is methylated, um, and, um, uh, and it's um, uh, interesting in this case because it was the first mechanistic uh, insight into this disease that maybe this uh, complex was somehow causing this disease. And it's also interesting because it was uh, already studied, um, the enzymes, um, DNA methylases, um, in, this, uh, um, in this complex have been studied and people have compounds and tool compounds and drugs that uh, target this process. And these preferentially killed cells and, um, uh, um, uh, in uh, cell lines in a mouse model uh, for this disease. Um, and again, I mentioned before that there was no known targeted treatment for this disease. It's, um, you know, and as a result, only could be treated with radiation and surgery. Um, when we found out this polychromopressor complex too might be involved and that there were known drugs and that they killed specifically these cells, um, immediately the, the, doctor, the physicians involved were uh, searched for a drug that might be uh, available to, to treat patients. And um, they found one uh, called azacitidine, or also called vidaza. And this drug is just general, a general DNA, um, anti-DNA methylation uh, drug. And so they were actually able to try it out on a patient um, on compassionate grounds. This is an individual at the Hospital for Sick Children who um, his pedomoma had metastasized to uh, the lung. And this is the, the showing the tumor here. And after two months, it had doubled in size. And um, so there was nothing left to do for this patient, unfortunately. So on compassionate grounds, they said, let's try this on the market uh, drug. It's been, this drug had been made for a type of blood disorder um, and had never been tried in any kind of neurological disorder. So um, they were able to try it. Uh, and one round of treatment, actually, um, one course of treatment actually stopped the tumor from growing, and uh, the effect lasted for 15 months before it started again, and the patient regained their energy, um, and they were able to leave the hospital. So it was actually an amazing result uh, that we were able to go from um, a genomic study uh, where nothing was really known about the disease to a mechanism, a drug, and trying it in a patient within about two years. Um, and now this drug is being, has, for the past few years, has been uh, is being part of the clinical trial to more generally test its eff efficacy. Um, okay, so here's another. Um, so, so that's a, that's my best example of how pathway enrichment analysis, at least in a project that we worked on, um, was successful in very quickly moving from you know, uh, as I said, going over the, over that process. This is another example, uh, just to show you different types of visualization that we can do with this type of data. Um, this is molecular classification of a pendimal tumor. So this is, again, a pendimoma, but not just focusing on this posterior fossa A, a pendimoma. It turns out there are um, nine different subtypes, not just A and B, but, uh, but a whole bunch of others, supertentorial and others mostly based on their anatomical region. And we did pathway uh, enrichment analysis based on gene expression data for all of these tumors and visualize them like this. Again, the circles here represent pathways uh, that are re represented as, uh, that are basically linked to a set of genes in the pathway, and the, the lines between them represent overlap between the pathway gene sets. So these pathways have something in common. They have genes in common, and they're thus grouped together. And then we label them all um, in this way, and we've colored them here based on um, which uh, subtype of pneumoma they occur in. And as you can see, um, some pathways are very 
specific to specific subtypes. So this is, you know, only this, this ion homeostasis pathway is only present in this one cyan subtype. Same thing with this one. Um, and here's one that's, you know, specific pathways in another subtype. And these pathways for neuron development are present in almost all the, the subtypes. Um, so uh, this gives a very nice overview of the biology of all of these different subtypes to, to display this like this. Um, sorry, I should have mentioned that. Um, feel free to interrupt if you have any questions. I can't see the Slack, unfortunately, um, because, um, but I'll try and turn on the chat here. And um, I know we're saying go to the Slack, but um, uh, if you have a question and you want to... So we actually just... turned off the Zoom chat, but... Oh, you turned uh, it off, okay. Yeah, okay. so don't try to look for it. <laughs> but okay. uh, definitely interrupt Gary if you need to, if you have a question. You're, yeah, and you're just... Very um, generous if... with the time, and so we're happy to support that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so sorry, I can't uh, quickly get Slack up at the same time I'm presenting. Okay, that's so quite here's... Right. Yeah. That's, that's here's, why um, you have... That's why we have the rest of us uh, to help you. If we see something okay. on Slack that deserves a, an interruption, we will definitely interrupt you. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, okay, so here's a, a fourth example. So this is um, an example based on single cell RNA sequencing of five healthy livers. Um, so each, this, this plot is sort of a typical plot from a single cell transcriptomics experiment where each dot represents a cell and the cells are organized in this map. In this case, it's a TISNY map, um, but the important point is that all the cells are organized so that c cells with similar gene expression profiles are grouped together and then clustered and colored. Uh, and, and it turns out that when you do that, you identify a whole bunch of cell types. And in this particular map, we identified 20 different cell types um, that were mostly known, although one of them was um, these inflammatory macrophages were uh, newly discovered. Um, you know, in the um, uh, in the, the liver, actually the subtyping. People didn't know that they didn't know that it was that there were two major things. So um, this was based on over 8,000 single cells um, from these samples. And one of the questions we um, had were we found a whole bunch of different clusters of hepatocytes, um, and we didn't really know what to make of this because. You know, we know that there's some uh, uh, um, anatomical uh, gradients that occur in the liver with hepatocytes, but um, you know, the question is, what? How are all these hepatocytes? You know, are they? Do they have some kind of specialized function? Um, and so we did a pathway enrichment analysis on that, and we, um, similar to the other plots that I showed, which are we call it we call enrichment maps, and we'll be talking about during this uh, workshop uh, later today. And um, uh, it, again, it's the same representation with pathways represented as circles, um, and, or gene sets, pathway gene sets represented as circles, and then they're grouped by redundant, um, uh, redundancy and labeled according to their pathway name. And um, so each of these uh, hepatocytes um, clusters, so you can see, um, uh, I don't have the cluster names here, but uh, cluster numbers, but all of these clusters are hepatocytes. And we ordered them based on where they anatomically occur, and then we showed the pathways uh, that were enriched in each, in each step. And there's some overlap here, so this, these boxes are overlapping a bit, um, but there's also a lot of specialization, which is interesting. So um, what this showed us is that the, um, that the uh, hepatocytes um, were, that were clustering are probably have different fun stem cell function. Um, some of these had more um, met metabolic functions that are known to be um, related to hepatocytes, um, but they were, these functions were spread over, over these clusters. So that was a nice visualization. Um, and I'm going to give you one more example, which is uh, getting into a little bit more about how pathway analysis is, or why pathway analysis is useful. Um, and this is the case of a genome-wide association study. In this case, uh, I'm not using a specific example, I'm just giving you a toy data set. And uh, let's imagine if we're doing a genome-wide association study that we have genotypes for 10 cases and 10 controls. 
um, actually it should say five, um, I guess five cases and five controls, sorry, um, that are, are listed here. So the ideal situation with a genome-wide association study is that um, you have, uh, you map up mutations in all of your cases and controls, and you look for repeated patterns that are associated only with the cases or only with the controls. So in, in an ideal situation, you might have SNP A is present in all the cases and none of the controls. So that's perfectly associated with cases. And you might have SNP D associated with all of the controls and none of the cases. So then it's perfectly associated with controls. And this would get a, a, like a perfect p-value to say it's perfectly associated with either cases, c controls, or cases. The reality is that when we look at real G GWAS data, it's much more frequent that it's like this, where each of the mutations is present in a different case. And this is more similar to the autism study where we didn't see the copy number variants in that case occurring over and over again across the cases in the same position very much. Um, instead, we saw them spread, the mutations spread out all over the genome. So if you had, if you were using traditional statistics, G, GWAS statistics, like um, the way that we assess the p-values of this ideal situation would be with a chi-square test or a Fisher's exact test, um, then um, you wouldn't be able to do anything with this situation, this more realistic situation, because the case would only have one count and the controls would have zero counts, and there would be all of the, the there would be no statistically significant associations of any of these mutations with cases or controls. So, um, so that's a that's a problem. Basically, means that this data has to be is is would traditionally be thought of as not successful. Um, however, if you looked at the same data using a pathway analysis view, so you took all those eight SNPs A to F, A B C D E F, and you recognized they're part of this, the same pathway. Maybe the, the pathway is called apoptosis. Now you can collapse them all so that you can say that all the cases that uh, are affected in the apoptosis pathway and then the controls are affected in the apoptosis pathway. And um, the, um, and I realize that I have some ones here and I shouldn't have put those here because that's, um, uh, let's say that those are all zero, sorry. Um, so um, the, um, uh, so in this case, we'd have all of the, uh, the SNPs um, all of the, the cases were affected in apoptosis and now the controls are affected in apoptosis. And now we do the exact same statistical test, like a chi-square test, that uh, could measure the um, you know, chance of having five cases affected versus zero controls, and we would get, again, a perfect association. So what happened here? So we were, we were able to increase our statistical power by doing um, two things. One is aggregating the counts. That's the main thing we did. So we took all of these individual counts and we combined them into um, one count. So that makes the signal stronger. And the second thing we did is, um, I didn't really explain very much, but um, we have uh, six SNPs here to test. And so this, um, we have to do six tests. And if we do six tests, there's a chance that we can get a test looking significant or uh, being significant by chance, and you have to correct for that with multiple testing correction, um, which we'll talk about later. And when we move to the pathway level, there's only one test. So we don't have to correct as much when we are working in the space of pathways, just because there are typically fewer pathways than genes or, in, in this case, SNPs. Um, this, the, another um, useful thing that we gained by converting the data into a pathway view is that we now know that apoptosis might be related to, the, to this disease somehow. And so that means that we've, we've gained some potential mechanistic understanding or at least generated a mechanistic hypothesis. For instance, apoptosis is related to the case phenotype that we didn't have before. And if we would have wanted to find that, we would have had to uh, take whatever signal we found from the SNPs, which was not even possible in this case, and look at the SNPs and which, which genes they might be affecting and then which pathways those those um, would be affecting. So, but this sort of automatically gives you this mechanistic hypothesis. Okay, so I think the last um, uh, example is another uh, theoretical example that's just to illustrate 
again, some of the analysis that we'll be learning about in the class today, is um, the case of a gene expression experiment or transcriptomics experiment where we have a set of differentially expressed genes. Like, let's imagine we have a thousand differentially expressed genes um, between um, samples. So in this, this heat map view, um, the columns represent samples and the rows represent genes and um, the colors represent the strength of the differential expression. Usually this is, you know, you have cases compared to control. So you might identify genes that are more expressed in your experimental condition of interest versus the controls, and those will be in this, let's say, red. So the more red they are, the more they're expressed in the cases. The more blue they are, the more they're expressed in the controls. And so we have a set of genes that's expressed more in cases and a set of genes that's expressed more in controls. And we want to know, and maybe, let's say we have about a thousand of them, we want to know, you know, what does this tell us about the um, uh, condition, the experimental condition we're studying, and we can do pathway enrichment analysis on that, and that can tell us something like I, I've showed you. But another type of analysis that we can do is uh, master regulator analysis, where we take known sets of transcription factors or microRNAs or whatever master regulator we're, we're interested in, and we take a database of uh, known targets of these transcription factors, and we test if those targets are significantly statistically significantly overlapping the genes in our list. And um, if they are enriched, then maybe this, these trans, this given transcription factor is an explanation for why these genes are differentially expressed. And so that might, give, uh, I, uh, might identify a, a, a regulator that's important. And then we could go test that by, for instance, perturbing the regulator in a, an experimental model and testing if um, we get the same phenotype or if our phenotype is uh, reversed or otherwise affected by perturbing the transcription factor. So again, it's sort of focused on get, helping us gain mechanistic insight into our data, mostly through hypothesis generation. Okay, just to summarize the benefits of pathway analysis uh, versus transcripts, proteins, and SNPs. Um, pathways are typically easier to interpret because they work with familiar concepts like apoptosis or the cell cycle, uh, compared to SNPs, for instance, or, or genes. Um, it helps identify possible causal mechanisms. It can be used to predict new roles for genes, so we might identify um, genes that are um, uh, um, linked to a disease, for instance, and it improves statistical power in the way that I explained. Um, another useful thing people have found is that it tends to be more reproducible in general. So, for instance, if you uh, have two different cohorts of data, two different data sets, or let's say two different people did an experiment um, on the same experimental condition, let's say it's a transcriptomics experiment, so each person collected 50 samples and measured transcript, uh, transcriptomics data on each of those samples. Um, and then try to identify um, a set of differentially expressed genes that might be used as a biomarker, for instance, um, to predict cases versus controls. What people have found is that those biomarkers tend not to be reproducible across studies for various reasons. There's lots of confounding factors that are not uh, known or possible to control perfectly in a genomics study is the main, the main reason. And, um, uh, and so that, that's really, um, you know, there's a lot of excitement at the beginning of genomics and proteomics to, that will identify all these biomarkers and will create a new precision medicine that will revolutionize all of our treatment and diagnosis. Um, and that really, you know, happened a little bit, but not as easily as people thought in the beginning. And the main reason for that was that these, these uh, biomarkers were not reproducible. Um, however, when mapped to pathways, they tend to be more reproducible because frequently when you looked at the genes that were involved in these biomarkers, even though they weren't necessarily the same gene, frequently they were affecting the same pathways. And so a, a pathway-based biomarker has been shown to be somewhat more reproducible than gene expression-based biomarkers in that case. Um, another thing that um, is useful is that you can integrate multiple different samples and data types. So let's say I do a pathway enrichment analysis on proteomics and uh, gene expression data and metabolomics data. All of the results are 
represented as pathways, and it's the same set of pathways. And so I can compare them. You know, the pie chart view that I showed you for ependymoma, um, you could make a pie chart view that is not just for different subtypes of ependymoma, but would be, for instance, um, uh, different gene expression, per protein expression, uh, different modes of genomics or omics analysis on your data. Um, okay. Um, oops. Um, so the, the, the typical pathway analysis workflow that we'll be focusing on in this course uh, starts with omics data collection. Um, we don't cover how to normalize and score that, but typically these uh, normalize and scoring methods are standard given the type of data that you're working with. And almost all of them will generate a gene list. Uh, and then the goal with pathway analysis and pathway network analysis is to learn about the underlying cellular mechanism. And, um, and that, uh, you know, we'll be talking about more during the class. And there's, there's a much bigger flowchart that we'll be going through that covers things in more detail and um, we'll uh, go through this in, in more detail in, in, the, in the course. Um, so, in particular, the workshop will cover pathway enrichment analysis, which is useful for summarizing, comparing data. I focus mostly on pathway enrichment analysis in my intro because um, that's the most popular technique, by, you know, most commonly applied technique by far. It's usually the first thing that people do uh, with a gene list. Um, we're also going to talk about network analysis. Um, I didn't include a slide here to distinguish these. Uh, the difference between pathways and networks, but the, um, I think it was in the intro that, that, that everybody watched uh, in the video, um, but the idea here is that pathways represent models of biological processes that are um, de developed over time through many studies. They're usually um, described in a mechanistic stepwise fashion um, that might include reactions or um, regulation events. Um, and, you know, I think everyone knows what a biological pathway is. Many examples of biological pathways like glycolysis or the TGF beta pathway. And um, network information, so, so pathway analysis is more focused on that type of information. Usually, uh, frequently, um, the pathways are mapped to sets of genes. Network analysis is, um, works with networks, so networks, we'll, we'll see. I showed you some networks um, here, but they're um, pathway relationship networks. You can make many different types of networks, like protein interaction networks, where um, you're, they're kind of capturing the, um, the relationships between lots of different proteins or genes. And network analysis is useful for, um, uh, it's also useful for the same types of things that I mentioned that pathway enrichment analysis is useful for, uh, gaining mechanistic insight into your data, um, it's just that there are some pros and cons of each one, which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about later. Um, but some of the things that we use network analysis for is to predict gene function, identify new pathway members, identify functional modules and new pathways that, that might not be obvious. Um, and uh, yeah, so one of the advantages of pathways is that it works with uh, well-studied concepts. One of the disadvantages of that is that because they're well studied, they don't cover all of the genes um, in the genome because we don't know the function of some genes. Uh, Barry, so network I, information, yeah? yeah? Sorry, Francis here. Can, can, can you say that networks are more sort of large scale studies and pathways are more like one gene studies in general? Yeah, I was just about to say that. And, okay. um, and I, yeah. I think that's, that's the case. So, um, so networks, one of the reasons why um, you know, network analysis is useful sometimes to discover new things is because um, we map networks using large-scale experiments, as Fran uh, Francis just mentioned. Uh, like if you're, if you're mapping protein interactions at a large scale with mass spectrometry, um, you map all types of genes, um, all types of genes, not just ones that have been studied previously in um, uh, uh, in a, in a focused way that's led to understanding um, what, how they work in a pathway. And because um, they cover more of the genome, it's useful to use that information. So these pathway and network types of information are related but, and, and somewhat complementary. Does that make sense? Um, 
Okay, so, um, and then we'll also talk about regulatory network analysis, which is more like the, the master regulator analysis that I mentioned, um, to find and analyze um, uh, master regulators or controllers in the, in the system.